take some of these ideas of nutrient recycling, specifically focusing on nitrogen cycling, in this really quite iconic, large, electrolytic way. So the objective that I'd like you to essentially take home from today is, so I want to demonstrate that this uh, consumer nutrient recycling, this CNR, really can have a significant effect on the nitrogen cycling in this large olive trope of clay. And then just to think a bit about what, what this might be in terms of implications for management. Uh, so just to step back a bit quickly and just look at um, why we're sort of interested in this. So um, the, the overall goal, if you look generally, of limnology is to sort of um, break down lakes from black box understanding where we don't really understand the processes that are happening and try to illuminate that into a white box understanding. So a white box model of the lake where we're really understanding the processes which are happening and we've got a really good progressive history of this in limnology and lake science where we are really kind of just progressively understanding these processes and it's giving us um, a better understanding for informing management decisions around lakes in terms of managing water quality such as uh, productivity. And if we're looking at um, looking at Topo and uh, this model as well, we really get to see how um, you know Topo really follows this this similar uh, trajectory through time where traditionally we've had some really fantastic research that has um, developed a great understanding of how the hydrodynamics affects the lake. So in Lake Topo, when the water mixes with the bottom the surface and bottom waters mix with the lake overturn in the winter time, then that's when you get the nutrients coming up into the water column and you get the main productivity in the lake which is, supports the food web throughout the year. And then uh, building on from this work we've got um, during the early 2000s with the regional bay variation 5 there was a lot of work put into understanding basically the catchment relationship with the lake. And what my work has been doing is really building on the bottom couple of sections here, so just understanding some of those biogeochemical processes and considering the food group dynamics and how they interact. So, how does the food group look in Lake Topo? And but, um, so let me just walk you through this here. So this is looking at the, the lake food web in terms of uh, basically flows of carbon and nitrogen. So um, uh, this is so this is uh, it's a stable this is a stable isotope pipe plot. So um, and the arrows basically show where energy is going in the system. So you will notice up the very top here we have adult trout. So they're the top of the food web, which is exactly what we expect. The next level. Sorry, the next level down, we've got the, um, the juvenile trout, the smelt, the catfish, and the bullies. And then right at the base of the food web, with um, the dots inside the green, um, the green bubbles, we've got the basal resources. So basically, we've got essentially two basal, primary basal resource, um, basal resources in total. So we've got our pelagic production, so that's our phytoplankton out in the middle of the lake, and we've got our the toral production, so that's the um, that's things that are growing around the lake shore. <clears throat> and as you go up the food web, essentially consumers are integrating these two primary, um, uh, these two uh, main trophic channels, so to speak. And um, we're more just looking at these um, the bubbles that are surrounding essentially these points here. So um, what they represent is the seasonal change. So if we're looking at snout and bullies, for example, I know it's a little, it's a little bit tricky to see, but essentially there's quite a um, horizontal spread there, which is essentially just showing that these consumers throughout the year are switching between these resources based on um, resource availability. And uh, so one of the great things with the stable isotope work is we can, because we're essentially looking at flows of nutrients, we can also compare so what does the catchment nutrients look like that are coming in? What is their isotopic signature? And what we see is that so the signature of the nitrate coming in from the catchment really well lines up with our basal resources. So this is essentially just confirming what we already know, which is that the um, that um, you know, that ultimately we're seeing that the catchment nutrients are driving the production within the lake. But um, if you look on the uh, right hand side, uh, sorry, uh, left hand side of the, um, the, the figure over here, the pelagic pond, we see there's a massive range within the, the, the signature of that, of that pond. So I'm, I would argue, um, so a big part of my research has been arguing that 
internal processes within the lake, which is essentially modifying that signature and twisting it and moving it in these different directions over a seasonal cycle. I'm not going to go into that data today, so what we are going to look into, so we're going to try and just do essentially a mass balance approach to try and quantify what these recycling processes are in the lake. So, um, here's a conceptual figure of the lake looking at the different processes which are supplying nutrients to phytoplankton out in the middle of the lake. So there's processes such as, um, you see the arrows coming up in the bottom water, so that's the, the, um, the hypothetical um, upwelling, so when the lake overturns, that's really large. During the summer, when the lake is stratified, that flux is a lot smaller. You've also got biological nitrogen fixation. We have cyanobacteria in the lake which uh, fix nitrogen, they, they're adding extra nitrogen in. Uh, atmospheric deposition, so just um, you know, nitrogen in the air or that gets caught up in rain falling onto the lake surface. We've got our riverine load, our catchment input coming in, and then we've also just got fluxing within the lake. So lakes, are, you know, as we've seen through um, through some of these previous talks, you know, lakes are very dynamic environments, water moves around a lot. And in the littoral zone, which is generally more productive, more nutrient rich, water can flux in, pick up these nutrients, and then be pulled back out to the um, pelagic, um, to the pelagic environment where it supports more productivity. Um, also, you'll see my um, my cute little fish here with the dotted arrow, that's the translocation. So, just in the same way that water can move, collect nutrients from the, um, from the littoral zone and take it out into the, um, into the mid lake area, so can fish. And um, as what I was alluding to in my previous figure, that's what fish do. They'll, they'll go select resource abundant areas, they'll feed there, and then if they're moving into these other areas, they're going to be essentially transporting, translocating nutrients. And finally, so other than all those fluxes, we've got this recycling process. So what is actually just um, the processes which are just recycling nutrients in, in situ to sustain um, production within the lake. So we can um, put all this together into a mass balance model. So roughly how that looks is We've, we take calculations for uh, phytoplankton uptake of dissolved organic nitrogen. So we've had um, another good thing to talk about is we've had some nice research that has quantified um, productivity within the lake. From that we can work out, so if we have a certain amount of productivity, this is how much um, nutrient um, nitrogen needs to be, um, needs to support that productivity. And then we can, um, we can subtract all these different fluxes which I've gone through, so the hypothetical flux, the literal exchange, so there's physical fluxes. Um, we can model those with models such as um, the physical hydrodynamic components of the models which um, Matt Allen was just going over before. And then we can draw on this substantial body of work that has um, helped in quantifying the external nitrogen budgets coming into the lake through the RPV5 process, so that's the atmospheric deposition, um, building on that with um, trying to refine some um, estimates for um, nitrogen fixation and also the catchment load. And from our food web uh, work, we can um, make estimates for what the consumer, trend, um, consumer translocation would be. And then, so once we, and then the residual should basically give us what the in situ recycling is. And for total, that is actually really high. So the recycling component of supporting that pelagic productivity is the, um, the, the pink areas, the, the lowest part of the bar here. So it's, um, note the, the scale on the, bar, on the bar graph only goes down to 50%, so it never gets below 70% of the, the phytoplankton demand um, being met by the recycling. And um, <coughs> so, this means that these biological processes are, dominant, are really dominating a lot of the, the productivity response that we're seeing within the lake. And, um, now, if we think about the case of Topo, where, we've, um, where we're actually managing nutrients in the lake quite, um, quite actively, that is focusing on the catchment nutrient inputs. So, um, oh, so just direct, this is looking at any moment in a given time, it's not looking at the cumulative effect of catchment nutrients, but 
Essentially, that's the grey part of the figure. So that's, at any point in time, that's only a tiny bit of what's actually affecting the, um, the catchment, um, the, the phytoplankton response in the lake. So that gives us an indication why it might take a long, why we might be taking a long time to see these responses. And also, it goes to show just how um, how we, it's really worth considering these biological processes which are happening associated with food web dynamics and how that can actually, you know, if that's accounting for upwards of 80%, upwards of 70% of the <coughs> nutrient cycling within the lake, this is going to have a quite substantial impact on, um, on um, nutrient, nitrogen, total nitrogen availability potentially, and also um, chlorophyll A, which are measures which, uh, um, you know, they're actually, we've actually got legislated limits for these in total that we're trying to manage towards. And I just wanted to quickly show that um, just looking at the translocation, so if we look at this just for smelt, the, so the ability of smelt to move nutrients between the littoral zone and into the um, into the pelagic zone, um, even at certain times of the year, just the flux of nutrients coming from smelt being translocated between these environments exceeds that of the physical transport of this large lake with a lot of wind action that's pushing water around. So that's quite substantial. So why should we be considering this? Uh, so basically, um, because as soon as we're thinking about uh, food web dynamics, we're thinking that the word dynamics basically um, explains it. Food webs are extremely dynamic. They go through cycles, they go through oscillations, and they're subject to both top-down and top and bottom-up controls, which um, I'll just so basically, this figure is show, uh, just showing that, um, that the, the relationships between zooplankton and phytoplankton can be a combination of push-pull dynamics, which is where, um, um, where processes are going through, um, like following these linear tracks, and also stable limit cycles, which is the um, top-down control, basically. And then if we were to zoom out and actually look at long-term um, patterns, so um, what these long-term cycles are. So if we're looking at the, the top predator of the system, trout, at the very top of the food web, they go through these extremely long multi-decadal oscillations. And we'd expect that in a system like Total, we have, we're obviously in strong interactions between the, the biological components of the lake and in the nutrient cycling, we'd expect to see some effect of these um, interdecadal cycles to have an effect on potentially productivity and nutrient cycling within the lab. So I'm going to leave it there. And um, there's a lot of people to, uh, to thank for this work, but in particular the advocates for the Tumanero, who are based down in Turangi and funded uh, the majority 